Hi, my name is Brendan Jackman. I work for Google in security. Today, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories and things that I've learned from working with BPF, a security auditing. My group is called Detection and Response. So we basically keep an eye on Google's systems, um, try and detect when unusual things are happening from a security perspective when we're under attack and respond to that as, as soon as possible. Um, I'm obviously concerned with the Linux part of that. And this is about just an overview of how that looks. We've got loads of Linux systems, all the way from servers that are running important services down to this laptop that I'm using right now. And they're all constantly piping telemetry and um, information that could be interesting from a security perspective into our um, software pipeline, which is doing some sort of clever stuff. And then from there to a whole lot of very clever humans, who are the people that will respond to any incidents that are occurring. So I fit in about here. My team builds the agent that actually runs on those Linux systems and it's sort of the first stage of that pipeline. Just to clear something important up, these machines, Google machines are like Google's own machines. My work laptop, but not my personal laptop and not your Chromebook, for example. Uh, yeah, so the kind of traditional way I suppose you'd do this would be with Audit and Audit D, and indeed we use it, but um, on the whole, it's just not flexible enough for our needs. And it can also sometimes be a bit too slow. Um, so we started with a kernel module, and that's what we had for a few years. Um, it was really hard to maintain for all the reasons that out of three kernel modules are hard to maintain. So we turned to BPF. Uh, and we would like to be extracting this information at sort of as high as high a semantic level as possible. Most of the places where you could attach BPF programs in those days were quite low level. So it was like trace points, function calls, system calls, I suppose. But what we decided to do was contribute the BPF LSM. So that right, lets you write LSMs in BPFs, yeah, LSMs in BPF. And LSMs basically give you an API inside the kernel that notifies you about events of interest to security. And it's at quite a high level. So instead of being like this system call was, call was made, it will be something like this process access this file or this process executed a sub process or something like that. Um, yeah, so it's really designed to let you say, no, that process can't execute some process because of this policy. Um, but we use it instead to just record that that happened so for auditing. So the first story I want to tell you is about atomics. The case I was looking at that motivated this project really was the programs that we run when processes get executed. And obviously that's something that can happen at the same time on different CPUs at once. So in that context, how do you generate a globally unique integer in your BPF program. Um, there have always been ways of doing this, but it's something that seemed too difficult at the time to me for something that's so useful, being able to generate unique values. Atomic operations seemed like the way to go. So I went to the BPF office hours and I drew some informal slides together and I said, hey, can we add atomics to BPF? I was quite timid. I said, let's add helpers, I think, if I remember rightly. Uh, and the maintainers were really positive and open-minded about this idea. And they actually said, no, let's go one step further. Let's do it properly and add atomic instructions. And let's actually modify the instruction set. Um, so I went away and designed it. Um, I don't have time to go into too much detail here. Um, at first, I was going to add some new opcodes entirely. Uh, Yong Hong from Facebook had a really smart idea um, that let us add a huge number of new instructions without breaking backwards compatibility and without using up new spaces in the opcode space. So that was cool. Um, this is what it looks like. I'm afraid I've got to skip over this a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, the, the moral of that story was really that um, this is a really open community. Uh, and within like a few months of going to that office hours just to explore the idea, not only was the code there in the kernel with help from other experts, but we were actually getting value from that internally at Google. Um, so it was a really fast turnaround and a really good investment. And um, yeah, I wish I could, I wish I had done more of it in the, in the year. Yeah, I want to share a couple of insights that I learned about ring buffers. Our project's really all about getting data from the kernel into user space, and there can be quite a lot of it. So yeah, I want to tell you about why we moved from the perf buffer to the BPF ring buffer. 
I think in the early days, the perf buffer was how you pass data through a ring buffer to user space from BPF. Um, but Andre designed and implemented the BPF ring buffer. And that was a big improvement for us for two reasons. Firstly, the perf buffer actually enforces that you have individual ring buffers for each CPU. So I guess that was a decision to avoid having to contend for the ring buffer pointers between the CPUs. But that actually is a really bad trade-off, or is for us at least, against memory usage. Because if you have to have an, a ring buffer per CPU, most of them are going to be empty most of the time, but they're still using up memory that you can't use for other things. So that was an inefficient, inefficient use of memory. Or if we wanted to be more efficient with memory, we had to sacrifice on the depth of the ring buffers, which kind of sacrifices our ability to tolerate huge bursts of data at once. And then the other sort of more minor downside is that those events can get reordered as you reconstruct them from the various ring buffers, which is something you can overcome, but it really adds complexity that you'd like to avoid in your user space agent. So we now, with the BPF ring buffer, we're able to share that ring buffer between all the different CPUs. Um, but the cool thing is that because it's a flexible system, even though it's lockless, there is some cache line contention, I suppose. And if you wanted to avoid that, you still could because you could do something like have one ring buffer per ca last level cache per four CPUs or something. Um, we haven't had to do that yet, but it's really great that we have that flexibility. Um, yeah, and this is just another trick that we do with ring buffers. Um, I'll start with an example. Um, one of the events that we like to report from the kernel is processes being executed, and we need to report all of their arguments and all of their environment variables. And that can be quite a lot of data. I think it's like six megabytes at the maximum or something. If there's a lot, if it's a busy period, the ring buffer might be full. And um, when that happens, we're going to lose a whole chunk of data at once if those messages are really big. Um, and there's quite a simple solution to that. We just break those messages up. So instead of saying, here's a message that tells you there was an execution, these were its arguments, and these were its environment variables, we say, there was an execution. That's the end of the message. And later, I promise to give you the environment, the environment variables and the arguments, and they'll be linked by a unique value, um, a unique ident identifier. And that's actually why I added atomics. As well as being um, reducing the amount of data that we lose when the ring buffer is full, or really important data, it actually lets us do some sort of asynchronous programming as well, because we can now say, an event happened. I'm going to report that synchronously. but. Uh, Later on, I'm going to come back in when I've gathered the extra data that I want, and I can um, add that data on retroactively. So yeah, another trick that we use with ring buffers is what we call chunking. So argument vectors are a good example of something that can be really big, but most of the time isn't. So it's got this really dynamic size. Unfortunately, the ring buffer, in order to work with the verifier, needs to know ahead of time how big the messages that you're going to allocate are. And if you don't, uh, your program won't load. So the naive solution to that is just to allocate the maximum possible size that your message could be. Um, but when that's six megabytes, that's not really tenable. Yeah, what we do is we just, instead of allocating one very large message uh, or allocating a dynamically sized message, which is impossible most of the time, we allocate a dynamic number of fixed size messages. And by adjusting the size of those individual chunks, we can trade off CPU in terms of individual messages being sent against memory uh, in terms of this padding. So if the chunks are smaller, you need less padding, but you use more CPU because it's more individual messages. So it, that's just another flexibility that's really useful when it comes to tuning our system. So yeah, a couple of things about the future. Um, for the last year, we've been pretty quiet uh, in the community because we've just been really heads down trying to get these systems deployed internally and delivering all the value that we promised. But some exciting things on the horizon are DNS auditing, uh, and that's got some really interesting challenges Florence working on. So um, hopefully I'll have something to share about that at some point. Um, KP has been looking into doing the kind of enforcement side of things with KRSI, which is something that it was always designed for, but we've never really been using so far. And the other thing is, like I said, we like to operate at this high semantic level where we can, but we're really often forced to drop down much lower and use things like trace points. So we're going to have to start looking into how to improve that. And hopefully there'll be some cool kind of contributions along with that. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I'm here to questions.